I'm sorry to take up some Bible study time to do that, but uh, my wife came to me about it about a month ago, and I've been praying about what to do because Children's Church is a benefit to our church, a huge benefit. And adults end up coming to church because their kids started going over there. Okay? So we're going to have good Children's Church, and I will not punish those that do good for those that don't, which would be just stop it. Right? That's wrong. I don't agree with that. Punishing the whole group for a few. And it's a few different ones. Don't think you can pinpoint which ones it is. It's somebody different. It might be the one you think is good that just refuses to listen that one night. Well, if you see them come swishing out through here, there's a reason for it. Okay? Thank you, Sister Manny. I was, I was just going to stand there and wait a while. There was a few times. I mean, part of the reason why I'm standing before you today, there was a few times that my daddy made every mom and grandma in the whole church mad. The whole church. Sister Manny? Well, I appreciate that. I know you will. You whoop me if you thought I needed it. Well, the deal is, I've told somebody this, I'm 40 years old. And if I went into my mama's house and she told me to bend over the bed, I don't know but one thing to do. Now, I'm probably going to try to talk her out of it. But if she's set on busting my britches, I don't know another thing to do. So, uh, uh, the focus of these lessons, I'm going to tell you what. I, I'm going to say, I'm going to talk about it again. I, I talked to Brother David about it before church a little bit. If I can ever convince you all to begin to pray through the tabernacle before you start your day, it's going to blow the top off of this church. It's unbelievable. what Pete, They've been trying to tell it to us. Brother McKinney's been trying to tell us for all of my life that we're going to have to pray. And I'm ashamed to say that it took me till I was 40 years old to get the kind of prayer life God wanted me to have. Now, there's been times in my life I prayed, never a time like I've been praying. And I can certainly tell a difference in myself. And the thing is, the beautiful thing about it is when you draw closer to the Lord, it don't matter what nobody else thinks of you. Brother Pete, don't have to seek approval from nobody else because we got it from the Lord. The focus of these lessons, last week, this week, then I'm going to be uh, not teaching for the next two Wednesdays, and then we'll pick it up after that. But the focus of these lessons is for us to encourage a lifestyle <laughs> to encourage a lifestyle that promotes revival. A lifestyle that promotes revival. Are you interested in having revival? Are you interested in having revival around your supper table on Monday night? That's the kind of revival we're seeking for. If you're waiting on a revival to just one day you show up at church and the, the fires of heaven are burning in every corner, you're probably not going to find it. But if we begin to have revival within ourselves, right? Within ourselves as an individual, then we will affect and infect those that are around us. Okay. The focus of these lessons is to encourage a lifestyle that promotes revival. We know well from biblical principle that you can have a revival of just one. Right? A perfect, that the, the Lord will move for one soul. The Lord will drag an evangelist away from a red-hot revival to minister to one soul. That's what he did, Brother David. That's what he did when the Ethiopian eunuch was out in the middle of the desert opening up the Bible and hungry for God. That's who I'm reaching for. If you're not hungry for God, I'm not going to do you any good. But if you're hungry 
If you're hungry to improve your walk with God, if you're hungry to have revival in your own life, if you're hungry to see miracles, signs, and wonders come because you pray, anybody hungry for that? Anybody hungry to be able to call out a need before the Lord and get the phone ring before you get through praying that God has met that need? We're going to learn, or in some cases relearn, the biblical steps that build us into disciples. None of them are dramatic. None of them are quick fixes. I remember thinking as I was coming up, if I could just get a blessing good enough. Come on, please, please stay with me. I know some of you are tired. But after church, I'll, if, you, if you care to, I'll tell you how I spent my day. Okay? I'll tell you, we, we're committed. Let me change that. I'm committed. I can't be committed for you. Committed to revival. But I remember thinking, if I could just get a good enough breakthrough in one service, Brother Pete, if I could just get one, one time, just get lost enough in the Holy Ghost, then I wouldn't have to fight them battles no more that I fought every day. Has anybody else ever thought that way? Boy, if I could get just a good enough dose, if I could shout enough, run enough, am I the only dummy that ever thought that? I just need to get one good boom blessing and it'll change my life. Well, I got a boom blessing and I got a boom blessing and I got a boom blessing, but guess what? By the next Sunday rolled around, I was starving to death again. Starving to death. So we're not going to be a quick fix. There's not going to be, you know, a, a Shazam moment when you go from being carnally minded to be spiritually minded and on fire for God. Not a quick fix. But there are principles that we can follow that will work in establishing. Everybody look up here now. I got my school teacher voice on tonight. The first century church, they impacted their world. Not only because of their doctrine and their experience, but it's what they did with what they had been given. It was what that they did as individuals with what they had been given. These don't work if they're practiced sporadically. They don't work. It's about like a diet. You know, I've heard several people say this, and I agree with it, a diet like Slim Fast. People that have had great luck with Slim Fast and lost a lot of weight on Slim Fast, guess what? When they stop drinking Slim Fast, they gain it back. But the way to keep it off on the Slim Fast, oh man, I could preach. On the Slim Fast diet is keep on drinking Slim Fast. Unless you tried to do it the way I did. I drank two of them with my supper. Didn't I, baby? I brought strawberry, Amanda brought chocolate. She didn't like them, so I took it upon myself to double dose it. Didn't work. This what I'm teaching to you is not going to work just getting a little bit fixed once in a while. It's not going to work just get anybody can get blessed. Anybody can get blessed at a given time. The, you think about what John tells us. What does John tell us about the miracles that Jesus did? Come on, very last chapter, almost the last words. The world couldn't contain the books if they were all written down. He did way more than we read about in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Way more. How many folks do you reckon that he impacted their life and they got healed from, and never followed him the first step? Undoubtedly multitudes will say, I don't know about that. I do because it was some of those same rascals standing there said, crucify him. Well, they went from... 
You think about it. You talk about just getting those blessings. They went from one day waving palm trees and crying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord to say and crucify him. So, so, so I love to have great church and I love to run and I love to shout and I love to get excited, but there's a whole lot more to living for God than that. And I don't say that just as a cliche. Because we say it, we like to say that, you know, like there's more to it than just shouting and running. Which I'm going to just go right on and say, we ain't doing enough shouting and running. They impacted their world because of what they did. Because of what they did with what they had been given. What God had given them. Acts 2 and 47 says, this describes the early church. Praising God. Praising God. When you have a lifestyle of discipleship, there'll be praise in your heart all the time. Before your feet hit the floor in the morning, you'll be saying, thank you, Jesus. Before, your last thought before you go to sleep at night will be a praise in your heart. When you're on fire for God, come on, we've been there before. You'll be washing the dishes. Some glad morning when this life is over. Mm -hmm. Singing Jesus songs. No longer singing your cheating heart, but singing them wholehearted in love with him. Praising God and having favor with all the people. Hold up a minute. God's people need to be thought well of in the community. God's people need to be deemed honest by the community. Brother Pete, I feel like running the aisles. I might before it's over with. I got to come over, overcome that fear. Y'all laughing at me. Having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. There was a reason that the Lord added to the church daily. It was because of the lifestyle and the commitment to that lifestyle that they exhibited on a daily basis. There's no time. I don't care if you're going on vacation or not. If you go to the beach, you still got the Holy Ghost. When you're a disciple of Christ, your holiness don't take a break. Your walk with God don't take a break. You'll witness to people if you're on vacation in Europe. Because it's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. I didn't know it, but I witnessed the two ladies at the funeral home last night. I didn't know it. But their brother, their sister and brother-in-law was an Assembly of God preacher that I was talking to, and they were sitting there, and they both died in the world Baptist. They'll fight you tooth and toenail over once saved, always saved. And I stood right there in front of them. I didn't know no better, Brother Robbie. I, I, probably a good thing I didn't know any better because I told them that we were just discussing, and I told the, the Assembly of God preaching them. I said, the, the Bible, and I begin to quote scriptures, don't teach once saved, always saved. That's just, a, and, and then they told me today, they came, they said, we're so happy you're back again today because we know the Lord used you to minister to my sisters. Hey, 
I didn't do it on purpose, Brother Terry. I didn't know it. But it's just a way of life. I talked to them people for 30 or 40 minutes just nonstop. He gave me his card. I, next time me and Amanda go junk it over Union City, I'm going to call him and see if I can go have dinner with him. And I'm going to share with that precious brother the oneness of God in Christ Jesus and Jesus' name, baptism. The Lord's going to make a way. There's no time to take a break from being an effective Christian. We can have the kind of revival that the early church had. As a matter of fact, in the early 1900s, when the believers began to believe God for the Holy Ghost once again, they had church just like when the disciples were around. The prevailing attitude was one preferring your brother and sacrificing in order to allow the Spirit to move. Hear me, at Azusa Street, people came from all over the world just to go to church at Azusa Street. People got on a boat in London, England, and rode it clear across the ocean just to go to one service at Azusa Street. They came from all over the world to experience their own personal Pentecost. When due to the technology of today, in the early 1900s, 1901, 1902, 1913, 1915, the world was much smaller than, I mean, much bigger than it is today. Right? The world was way bigger than it is today. You can go home after church and you can talk to somebody in Afghanistan on your computer. You can go home after church, Brother Robbie, and talk to somebody in the Philippines on your computer. And you do it pretty often. The world is small now. This was way before the world was small. Brother Pete, they would mail a letter and it would get there. And then they would get their stuff together, sell what they had, and come to America to go to church. I don't know if some of you believe me or not, but it's the truth. It's the truth. People would leave the East Coast, to go all the way to the West Coast just to be in church. That's how it was when this Holy Ghost was poured out in the 1900s. The word spread, not because God decided it was time, because he never changes, but because men and women made it their life's mission to seek the Lord and to follow his direction. Simply what they did, simply speaking what they did, is they made a commitment to live for God every day. In Acts 17 and 6, their enemies referred to them. They were called, referred to by the enemy as those that have turned their world upside down. That's what the enemy said, Brother Pete. The ones against the church said, those that have turned their world upside down have come hither also. When Paul stood before Agrippa, he reminded Agrippa, he said, Agrippa knows this, it's not hid for him because this thing was not done in a corner. This was a testimony. Now you hear me right now, and I don't mean to be sacrilegious. God knows I'm not, that I'm not in any way diminishing the power of the Holy Ghost. But this was a testimony. The testimony was not of Jesus Christ. The testimony was of the men and women whose lives had been changed by Jesus Christ. Jesus had ascended, Brother Pete, and the Holy Ghost was here. They didn't believe in Jesus Christ because they couldn't see him. But they ended up believing in the Lord because of what they could see him doing in the lives of the people they met. They gave a God all glory. They truly lived when the Bible says we are living epistles. Tonight we will cover the first of five discipleship habits, which is ministry. Everybody say ministry. You automatically, when you talk about minister, think of a preacher. Is that not true? We'll think of a preacher. The word ministry comes from the Greek word diakonia. It means the office and work of a servant, attendant, 
minister, or deacon. This word is used, this word is used of domestic duties. Anybody want to break it down into common language what domestic duties are? Sweeping the floor. Washing the dishes. It is used to describe the work of Martha. When the Bible said that Martha was doing the work and Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus and she run to the Lord and said, make Mary help me. I'm doing all the work. It Martha describes, and ladies and gentlemen, I've got to let you know from the Bible that when you run the sweeper on your cleanup day, it is ministry. When you dump the trash, it's ministry. When you get out of your car and there's a candy bar wrapper laying in the parking lot, and you stoop down to pick it up and throw it in the trash, it's ministry. This word is used of religious and spiritual ministration, of apostolic ministry, such as the disciples, Paul, Barnabas, Timothy, Silas, etc. It's used of the service of believers, which is described in the Bible, too much for me to tell you, you can look it up for yourself, of caring for the needs of others. Ministrations, which is giving of time and money and caring for the ministry. And then it is used for the actual word ministry when it refers to, when, for instance, when Paul told Timothy, take Mark with you because he's profitable for the ministry. That is assisting the preaching ministry, among other things. Ministry is used for a wide variant of things, uh, not the least of which is the preaching of the gospel. Remember, it's discipleship, being like the early church. Now, this next verse I'm going to cover with you, the next two verses, I will tell you that I never got them until I found these papers by Brother Woodburn and began to study it. But it's amazing, Brother Pete. Once it was opened up to me, it's one of those things. I should have seen it years ago. Right? How many of you have had that happen before? Come on, y'all stay with me now. Y'all stay with me. I studied for hours, read the Bible, prayed and fasted for eight days. Not really. But... I am so convinced if you receive this, it works. I've been telling people, start a prayer life. And then when I go back and talk to them again, I don't have time. Or I just think, I know I need to, but I hadn't. I can preach it till I'm blue in the face. But until it's done, it profits nothing but we become forgetful hearers of the word. The Bible would not, Brother Pete, the Bible would not have given that for me to teach except he knew it was going to be a problem. Yeah. Knew it was going to be a problem. We've got to receive it. We've got to receive the word. Paul gave us a good explanation of how the ministry is supposed to work. Ephesians chapter number 4, verse number 11 and verse number 12. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, what is that commonly known as? The fivefold ministry. Some say it's actually a fourfold ministry because pastors and teachers can you generally hold the same office? But it is commonly referred to as the five-fold ministry. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Regardless of if it's five or fourfold, these are the offices that lead the church. And everybody said amen. amen. I don't have this in my notes and all, but the Bible gives very strong, very strong scripture for leadership. 
Know them that labor among you and are over you in the Lord. Along with those that are in Hebrews, when it says, we watch for your soul. Amen. It is the responsibility of those in leadership to inspire, to motivate, to disciple, to instruct, and prepare the saints. Now, here's how I have often, I have always misunderstood this scripture. How many of you know you won't go to hell for misunderstanding the scripture? It's going to happen sometimes, Sister Nadine. Sometimes because we don't understand the context. Sometimes, so we, we will begin to study it out. And the Bible says that he'll lead and guide you. Amen? Think about this. I'm going to tell you how I've always interpreted it. And then I'm going to tell you how it's meant to be interpreted. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, Brother David, the way that I've taught this is that it gives the fivefold ministry and then the threefold jobs of the fivefold ministry. Right? Then it gives the fivefold ministry and then it tells you what the fivefold ministry does. Right? See it there? for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. When in fact, it gives the one job of the fivefold ministry and the two things that follow it are the effects of an effective fivefold ministry. He gave some apostles, some prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. Okay. Now, is it starting to make sense to you now? Huh? And then, it's perfecting the, what's that word perfect mean right there? Complete. Maturing. It is the responsibility of the preaching ministry to lead the saints of God into a state of maturity where they can each become ministers of Jesus Christ. And when we succeed at the first step, then when we all... i got to work off a little bit of energy. When we all begin... When we all begin to fulfill what God has called us to do, when we let the word be applied to our life in such a way that it changes us, in such a way that it motivates us and moves us, the scripture is for correction. Correction, which says what? You're going the wrong way. And instruction in righteousness, which says what? This is the right way. And when we all begin to do the work of the ministry, Brother David, then that is for the edifying of the body. My goodness. My goodness gracious. Y'all might regret that I ever found out about that praying through the tabernacle. And y'all might regret that the Lord ever started speaking to me through his word. Because, Brother Pete, I, I feel like I'm about to explode inside when I see the things that, when I see the things God wants for his people. And I'm so passionate about it. I'm so excited about it. And then if I'm not careful, I get discouraged because I see people fighting sleep. I ain't that bad of a preacher. I know people are tired, but I can't imagine, can't imagine what I'm about to show you. If I, if I was going to come in here, if I was going to come in here and show you a way, and show you a way 
that tomorrow you could take $100,000 and put it in the bank. Every one of you would be on the edge of your seat. But I'm about to show you, I am, by the help of the Lord, leading you into such a place. That's my responsibility. To lead you into such a place where we can live a life of revival every day. Come on, I see some of you put it on Facebook that when you do such and such, the devil don't want me to wake up in the morning. The devil's afraid when my feet hit the floor. How many of you have seen that on there before? I'm telling you, we can get to that place. You can get to that place. <laughs> oh, Brother David, I wish y'all could have been in here with me that morning when the Lord gave me that scripture about don't be preaching to people's faces because I'm so excited right now because I know it's going to work. It may only be working on two or three. But that's all I need. That's all we need. That's all we need. Saints of God, it works. It works. For the perfecting, the maturing, the equipping of the saints. This is so the saints can do the work of the ministry. It's then that the church is edified or built up. And when this happened, revival is soon to follow. The more people that we have operating in the perfect will of God, the more freedom, the power of God has to flow. Here's why we don't do it. Are you ready? The first reason why we don't is we don't know where we belong. Why would we not know what God wanted for us? Is my microphone working? Why? You're right, Brother Johnny, but they can't hear you. Why would we ever be in a place where we have no idea what God wants for us? Say it out loud. Don't be scared. I heard somebody say it. It's generally attributed to a lack of a prayer life. He can't talk to you if you're not letting him talk to you. How many of you have ever worked for a guy, had a boss that expected you to read his mind? Guess what? It don't work. It doesn't work. Boy, if I could break dance and moonwalk and had some rhythm, I'd just bust out right now. It doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Because you do what he thinks he wants you to do. Since you all flunked mine reading the same that I did, it might be wrong. So then he's going to be mad at you twice. Once, because you didn't know really what he was thinking, and two, because you did what was wrong. And many of us trying to live our life for God the same way. You've got to get a prayer life if you want to be an essential part of the kingdom of God. Because you've got to know what he wants. God is my witness. God is my witness. I thought for sure I was going to be done way early tonight and not even know what to do. Guess what? Ain't happening. The second reason why is we're scared. Thank God for our new CD ministry. I went last night. I bought 100 new CDs, 100 more of them. I bought a case to put all the master copies in. You want a copy of some messages? They cost you $1 a piece. You can get as many as you want. You want 100 bring 100 bucks. If you're still afraid, if you're still afraid, borrow Sister Eloise's CD. 
of the message I preached three weeks or so ago about having fear and praise and listen to it until you ain't scared no more. Huh? Brother Shannon's got it rigged up. We can make, a, make as many copies of it as you want. But if you're still scared, you just didn't receive the word. Because when I preached that message that night, the bondage of fear was broke in this church. Oh, you tell me tell you something. I've been hearing, I've been hearing people pray out loud now that I didn't hear pray out loud before. I've been noticing people getting involved. It's broke. If you're still battling fear, you're just believing a lie that the devil's telling you. There's no fear in love. Because perfect love casts out all fear. I just got excited and shut my big deal down. The third reason why that we don't know why that we are not walking in the ministry God's given us is we're afraid of the commitment it's going to cost us. The afraid of the commitment in our personal life, afraid of the commitment of our time, and afraid of the commitment that it's going to cost us financially. Because you begin to walk, boy, you begin to walk close to God, you give away money all the time. Never. And he'll never ask you to give something away that he don't plan on replenishing. One of the greatest, one of the greatest attributes of a revival church is that they will constantly be among the leaders in giving. And the fourth reason why is that we're ignorant of the fact that God has a ministry for us. We don't even know that as we grow in the Lord, we have more to offer. It's not always about what I can come to church and get. But it will soon. It will soon become, what can I go to church to give? Who can I share my walk with God with? Who can I pray with with the gift of faith? Oh, I tell you what. When we begin to grasp what the Lord is trying to do among us. And there may be other reasons why we don't. But I want you to hear me right now. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 18, 19, and 20. Put it up there, brother. I can't stand behind that thing. Everybody read that out loud for me together. Read it again. But now... Hath God set the members, every one of them? Do you reckon that one of the hindrances to revival is people failing to realize God's already put you where he wants you? God has already put you where it pleased him. He's just waiting on you to accept it. He's just waiting on you to see it. He might just be waiting on the opportunity to tell you about it. To tell you, imagine this. You don't have to go nowhere. You've been there for eight months. You've been there. 
You have been right where you're supposed to be. I have put you in contact with who you need to be in contact with. I have equipped you to be able to say what you need to say. I have anointed you to say what you need to say. I'm just waiting on you to do it. Because the Bible says, everybody doesn't do the same thing. And if they were all one member, verse 19 says, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body? God has set the members in the body where he wants them. The question we got to ask ourselves, am I, am I where God wants me to be? Am I doing what God wants me to do? And I'm going to unequivocally stand before you as the anointed man of God in your life and tell you that there's not a job for do nothing. And the reason why many of us may be lacking fulfillment in our life is we are in fact doing that. Say, oh, you're throwing stones. No, I'm not. Been there myself, Brother David. I've been there by myself. Brother Pete, when I didn't feel like I was adding one thing to the body of Christ. Has anybody else been there? Here's where else I've been. I've been where I was adding nothing to the body of Christ. Just showing up, getting my blessing that would run out before next Sunday. God has set members in the body. It's not hard for you to fathom. It's not hard for you to fathom the pastor, the man of God being where God wants him. But it's more difficult believing it for ourselves. As it has pleased him, not pleasing us, not fueled by personal ambition, but as it has pleased the Lord. We think often of our actions being pleasing to him. We think often of us doing something that would be pleasing to God, doing good deeds, obeying the scripture, giving, living a holy life, etc. But I would ask you today, are you pleasing him by being the fully functioning part of the body that he desires? It's difficult sometimes to not have our minds clouded by fleshly ambition or ego or then your own imagination will work against you. Then the devil, if, the, if you constantly feel like I'm no good for nothing, I can't do nothing, if I can ever get you to grasp a hold of what God wants for you to do, you could be the most dynamic soul winner that this church has ever seen. Because if you're constantly feeling like you're no good, you're no good for nothing, you're no benefit, that's because the devil wants to keep you that way. I did not get near enough amens on that. But I'm telling you tonight, I'm telling you tonight that those days have got to be over. They've got to be over. How many of you, your own imagination works against you? I'm not worthy. I'm not good. I'm not talented. I can't do anything. The devil's telling you that for a reason. Brother Dole, I believe that the Bible, the Bible gives us strong evidence that when Jesus and the angels are sitting around talking, the devil eavesdrops. And you just give me a little bit of evangelistic liberty. Jesus says, Gabriel, have, can you believe how long it took us to get Johnny Henry to begin to do what we wanted him to do? You, you ought to just see him. Because remember, the Lord knows the end from the beginning. Gabriel, you ought to see him five years from now if you think he's doing good now. You ought to see what he's going to be doing. Because the Lord says that stuff, Sister Maria. He says, hast thou considered my servant Maria? Huh? So the death. Well, I could speak into somebody's life right now if you just let me. So the devil knows the plans God has for you. So what does he start doing? Trying to kill. Trying to steal. And destroy. That's all he can do. 
Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. My God, have mercy. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. Main reason that I taught the prayer pattern was for us to be prepared spiritually, to get used to hearing the voice of God, of dying out to the flesh, so that this assembly could work as a finely tuned machine, Brother Pete, hitting on all cylinders. Oh, it's a beautiful thing when something has been not working at full capacity to find the little tweak, to find the little setting, and to be able to see it begin to chuck, 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 and doing exactly what it was meant to be doing. Elders, hear me right now. You know I can't go very long without preaching to our elders. I've told you many times I need you. I rely on you. I count on you. I believe in you. I want you to hear this. You don't retire from the body of Christ. If, Brother David, if the Bible says he's put you in the body where it pleased him, you will stay in the body till he ain't pleased with you being there no more. You don't quit being involved when it's no longer convenient. You cease to be involved when he decides. And you know when that's going to be? That's going to be when one of two things happen. The trumpet sounds or he calls you home. Why did it get so quiet in here? You sisters that are, your, that are way up in years, let me tell you something. Before you go to bed every night, call my name out before the Lord. Call my name out before the Lord. You need a ministry? Let me give you one. You be the armor bearers for the pastor of this church. I feel like that I could, if you'll excuse me for you and using Louis Lamar in the church house, I feel like uh, that if I, got to, if I got all of our ladies uh, that are in their 70s and above praying for me every night, I feel like I could charge hell with a bucket of water and put it out. And Brother Pete, that, my friend, is ministry. It's ministry. It's war going on in the atmosphere. Don't you misunderstand and think that all of our opportunities to minister are, are in these walls. Brother David, this is some of the best preaching I've done in months. I promise you, I feel more anointing right now than I've felt in weeks. The Holy Ghost is in what I'm saying to you. The Holy Ghost is here. The Holy Ghost is ministering. Do not be like the young rich ruler. When he didn't hear what he wanted to hear, Brother Pete, even though it was true, he walked away sorrowful. We talked about it Monday night. He walked away sorrowful. He missed out. Brother Pete, the Lord said, do this, and you'll have eternal life. And the Bible said he went away sorrowful. <laughs> Acts chapter 6, I'm winding up. I'll tell you what. I'm going to skip that. Let's stand. I've said everything the Lord wanted me to say tonight. Except this. Let me caution you. God won't elevate you until you're ready to be elevated. And if I'm tapped into the Holy Ghost, I won't elevate you into a position before you need to be elevated. Here's some good advice. We've got some new converts. We've got some elders that I feel like that the Lord has led me to minister to you tonight. 2 Timothy 2 and 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God. I don't know if I even have to go any further than that, Brother Pete.
Study to show thyself approved unto God. Hungry. 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 Hungry for God's approval. Oh, I've got big dreams, saints of God. And how many, how many times have I told you, if somebody don't laugh at them, they probably didn't come from God. I've got dreams of us having a big going away party here from some young couple that the Lord's called to be a missionary to Africa out of our church. Wouldn't that be awesome? Oh, wouldn't that be awesome to have a going away party? For God to, you know, Sister Nadine, I kind of feel the same way, but I'm going past that. I felt it, I felt it, uh, a friend of mine talked to me yesterday. There's a young man in his church that's going with him to New York to start a church. And his parents are all upset. I've got to get to the point where if it takes my children going to Zimbabwe, because to be where God wants them to be, then old daddy Rose just going to have to pray them through there. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman, my goodness gracious. Brother David, we could have throw down right now. A workman that needeth not be ashamed. I wonder if I'm doing what's right. I'm wondering where if I need to be. You can remove that. Remove it. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Saints, I love you. I believe in you. Everyone under the sound of my voice, every one of you under the sound of my voice, God wants to use you. God has a place for you. He's already put you in the body. As it hath pleased him, Brother Pete. My God, have mercy. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. I do. I feel the power of God in this place ministering. Great revival's coming to New Madrid. Great revival's coming to New Madrid. What I was going to talk to you about, Acts chapter number 6, the church began to grow so fast that the preacher couldn't keep up with everything needed to be done. I'll take that. If you're here tonight and you've gotten upset or you've got aggravated or agitated or felt offended, praise the Lord. That thrills me to no end because there's a very good chance what I said is for you. Let's lift our hands thank the Lord for his presence. Lord, we love you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your word, Lord. It is truly a lamp unto my feet and a light into my path. I can't make it if I hide your word in my heart. This word has spoke to us tonight. It spoke to us as a body. It has, it has spoke to us a word that is, that is relevant and applicable to each and every one of us. It's spoken to some people, some folks that think they're incognito all the time, sitting off to the side, but the Lord has reached into your heart uh, and begin to pull that commitment out uh, and let that rose unfold by natural means uh, as we pursue you, pursue your face, pursue your glory, pursue your power in our lives, in our lives, Lord. I want to be a part of the body a fully functioning part of the body. I don't want to cast on my part of the body. I don't want to splint on my part of the body, but I want to do the work of the Lord. I want to do the work of the Lord for the perfecting of the saints, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come, till we all come in the unity of the Spirit. Thinking about that old song right now. The old troubadour from the big metropolis of Gideon, Missouri wrote it. it. Says, Dear Lord, I'll be a witness if you'll just help my weakness. I know that I'm not worthy, Lord, of you. So Jesus, use me. Oh, Lord, please don't refuse me. Surely, 
Surely you can say that emphatically tonight. Lord, there's a work for me. I know what it is and I'm scared. I know what it is and I don't want to be committed. I don't know what it is. I didn't know there was a work for me. Now I know there's a work for me to do in the kingdom. And if I do my work, Brother Terry, he will say, well done. My God, have mercy. My God, have mercy. Tomorrow night, everybody say tomorrow night. Six o'clock.